Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. When I was younger, around 17, I lived in a small village of 1,200 people. Usually every year, there is a local town festival and all the adults go for dinner and party at the town hall where they perform some acting and make fun of the year that just passed. Usually, this is in February, so it's snowy and dark pretty early. When this festival is there, there are absolutely 13 to 17-year-old girls booked for babysitting. Me and my two friends went for a drive around the town, since you have to be 18 to go to the party, so we just drove around and giving people lift to the party and earned some extra cash. Since there was no taxi in this town, this was a great way to get some extra pocket money. We had been driving for a couple of hours, and of course, we knew where everyone lived, and some of the adults asked us to drive past their house to make sure everything is alright and give the parents some extra comfort. I think it was also to give us some tasking until the party was over so they could get a lift home. In one of the older neighborhoods in town, there were low floodlights, so we just drove slowly, and one mom who we gave a lift earlier lived there. She was a widow with three young children, two, four, and eight, if I recall correctly, and her niece was babysitting them. She was around 15. The time was around 10 p.m., and when we drove in this neighborhood, which is surrounded by a hill and some cliffs, my friend swore that she saw something move in her garden. We thought little of it and just said that it was probably a cat or something. We kept driving to the other end of town, but my friend in the backseat said that he had a bad feeling and wanted to drive back to her house and check if he could see some footprints in the snow. When we got back there, we parked the car and looked over the fence, and there were fairly new human footprints in the snow, adult size. So, we all looked at each other and decided to follow the trail. The trail went past all the bedrooms, but near every window. The footprint turned to the window like someone was trying to peek in. Eventually, the trail ended on the street and we lost it where the snow plow had been earlier in the night. We chatted if we should go and get the mom from the party or ring the doorbell to check if everything was alright. Since none of the tracks lead to the back door or the front door, we decided that two of us would stay in the neighborhood hidden and monitor the house and the driver would drive to the police station and pick up the mom on the way back. That was a good call. Maybe five minutes after he left, we saw someone lurking behind one of the garage a couple of houses down. He wasn't moving. He just sat there with a cigarette. We monitored from a distance since he couldn't see us. And then, he stood up. He looked around and started to creep to the house where the mom lived, and he walked to the back door. Without thinking, me and my friend ran through the two gardens that were between where we were and the mom's house, so we would catch him trying to enter the back door. We arrived just in time. He was trying to open the door when we shouted at him. What the hell are you doing? And he made a run for it and we followed. He ran down to the street to get some speed ahead of us. But we were both athletics, so we were gaining on him. This was the most intense moment of our life. I remember the only thing that I was thinking was not to slip and lose momentum. The end of the street was approaching, and the next turn would be 90 degrees to the right. So instead of slowing down, I jumped off the street so I could intercept him after he would lose speed by taking the turn. My calculation was wrong and he managed to take the turn without losing much speed. 
I spent too much energy sprinting in a feet deep snow and I knew I would have to slow down. I was still about 10 meters behind him, but my friend was closer and gaining on him. When my friend realized that he could kick his feet and trip him, he did. He fell and this was the quickest takedown ever. Smashed his head to the frozen ground and he was out. And while we were catching our breath, he didn't move. We rolled him over on the back and he was breathing, but really shallow with a cracking noise. I was terrified. Millions of questions came to my mind. Is he dying? What if this was just some relative making a prank? Why did we chase him? Meanwhile, my friend checked his pocket and there was a lubricant for adults, a strong sedative, and a broken camera. Luckily, the driver came a couple of minutes after with the mom and the police, then the ambulance arrived and took him away. The day after, we were brought for questions in the police station and the chief told us that he was a known pedophile but not from our town and we for sure saved that day and probably more kids since the tumble he took when he fell, he got a bleeding in the brain and is not able to wipe his ass anymore. We told him the story and when my friend said he tripped him, the chief stopped typing and said, Are you sure you tripped him? The way I see it, three heroes caught a burglar in the act, and while he was running away he fell and hit his head, and looked at us and nodded with a soft smile. But thinking back, this perv must have planned this, knowing when the festival was, knowing that she was a single mom, and picking out the house. Knowing that gives me the creeps. So, this may not be creepy to some, but I certainly thought it was or at the very least unsettling, considering it was a child. I started watching this little girl, Bailey, in about 2002. I'd been babysitting for a few years at that time, and my parents made for a great free walking advertisement. Bailey was actually my mom's boss's daughter. She was okay for the most part, I would say she was probably your typical only child that got anything that she wanted. And she was definitely spoiled. They didn't really have any rules on things she wasn't allowed to have or do. The only real rule was that, if I was watching late, she had to be in bed by nine. Even though she was very much aware of this rule, she always gave me grief about it. She would whine, beg, or delay as much as possible, like spending way too long washing her hands to avoid bed. Otherwise, if she got in trouble or told no, she tried throwing tantrums. I grew up with some pretty tough grandparents, and they did not tolerate that kind of thing, so I pride myself on being able to stop the kids that I babysat from doing the same. It worked on her for the most part, when she realized that it wouldn't change my answer. I would assume it typically worked on her parents. There were a few times that she would get pretty angry and try to hit or kick me, and I made sure to let her know that that was never okay, so she would be sent to her room until she calmed down. Since my mom knew her mom, I asked her beforehand as to what if anything, I should tell her parents, and she agreed that I should tell them everything. Her behavior was not okay, and it was best to get it under control now while she was still so young. So, one time, when her dad got home, I told her what was going on. He reminded me of my own dad in the sense that he seemed like the enforcer, as opposed to the mom being the spoiler. He agreed that she was being aggressive, and tried doing the same to her mom, but 
never tried with him, and he promised that they were working on it. I felt like he was being honest and pretty much left it at that. I know there were a few times that she seemed to get upset, but without me even saying anything, she would drop what she was doing and storm off to her room. She would then come out a short time later and continue doing what she had started. But then, she started getting creepy. In the living room, there was a corner that was her play area. It had some of her bigger setups, like the play kitchen that had a sink, an oven, and an overhead cabinet, as well as a small chest that had the kitchen stuff in it, and some of her toys. I was reading a book while the TV was playing some show that she had turned on. She moved over to her toys, and would go back and forth between watching and playing. She had some kind of doll that she was pretending like she was talking to, and making food for on the stove. I would look up on occasion just to see what she was doing, but otherwise I let her do her thing. But then, I could hear her whispering, but it was fast, like she was really trying to get her point across. I figured she was still just playing around, so I didn't look up from my book and just listened. She would then sigh and whisper something else that I couldn't make out. I couldn't help but look up when I started hearing a thudding sound, and all I saw was her smashing this doll's head into the cabinet door. I watched this play out for a few seconds, and a few head smashes, when I finally tried to get her attention by saying, Bailey, what are you doing? And her only response was, She's getting punished. I, again just watched until she finally stopped. She threw the doll in the little play oven, and then slammed it shut. Only a little alarmed, I asked her why she did that, and she told me that she made her mad because she wouldn't get into the car. She had like a little Barbie car that she was trying to put it into, but it was too big. That was a bit aggressive for her, so... I told her that what she was doing was pretty mean, and that's not something she should think about doing when she gets angry. She then looked at me confused, saying, Daddy said this was okay, because they're not real. That was pretty scary to me. I understand trying to offer alternatives to hitting or kicking people, but I don't feel like this was a good solution. So, I tried myself. I said it was okay to be frustrated or angry, but that being violent was never a good way to release the anger. While I was talking to her, she interrupted me, saying with a smile, But it's okay to kill my dolls, because they're not real and they can't scream and get me in trouble. I didn't even know how to respond. I guess her dad wasn't as assertive as I thought he was. I swear... I felt like a parent that day trying to explain to this child as to why what she was doing was not okay, real or fake. She did love to color, and she liked to set things up like poses and color it. She once had a stuffed animal sitting on the floor holding something, and she drew and colored it. It still looked like a young kid did it, but you could make out what it was supposed to be, I thought since she was so passionate about it that I told her to try to use that as a way to relieve stress instead of being so violent. She seemed confused at first, as kids do, but then started to like the idea. I tried being a little silly about it and drew an angry rabbit, so she started to draw more. I didn't know what to do with this, though, because it seemed like her dad knew about it. I didn't feel like the violence was okay by any means, though, so again, I told my mom about it, and she agreed that they should at least know what happened. She said that she would talk to her boss about it because she was pretty cool with her, and I remember kind of joking with her dad about it when I brought it up. I continued to watch her, and she had a few more outbursts, but I would always give her that look, and she would storm off to her room and start coloring aggressively. I don't know if she did it all the time when I wasn't there, but 
I hope they kept up with it, or something better than violence. Her dad said he was working on the outburst with her, but never really specified how. I stopped watching her after a year or so, when I moved out of state, but I've wondered how she is mentally. It's people like that that I hope grow out of that kind of thing, but it's still kind of creepy to think about what it could turn into. When I was around 15, I had started babysitting a family with three kids, two boys and one girl. Their mom knew me, as the oldest were friends with my little brother, and had asked my mom if I could help out just because she had started taking on more shifts and her husband was doing the same. They lived right next to my high school and paid so well, so I agreed despite not really having that much experience. Pretty quickly I realized that it was going to be difficult. The kids were great, but I was so nervous around them. The oldest was fine. He just played on his Xbox most of the time or done homework. But the two youngest were a different story. The middle child, the daughter, was completely obsessed with horror movies. And on more than one occasion, I had to hide the knives from her since she wanted to reenact them, and the youngest son tried to set fire to the Christmas tree. I know what kids can be like since I have a lot of younger and older cousins, but these ones drove me insane and I would constantly worry about them hurting themselves or each other. If they played up, I would threaten to call their mom, which normally would work. It was after a few months that I realized if I had mentioned the dad, that's when they would really just behave and do what I had asked, so that's what I started doing. Now, I never really ever met the dad. I just knew that the guy was really tall and big built, but was always described to me as still being really nice, so I never thought about it. On this occasion, I had said to the youngest boy, that I would call his dad if he didn't stop behaving, which resulted in a huge tantrum. So, I ended up calling him and explaining. Luckily for me, the dad was getting off work early, so he said that he would get home as quick as he could and apologized for the kid's behavior. When I had explained this, the kid was sobbing and ended up locking himself in his room. That day, the dad got home, and they weren't joking when they said he was tall. I'm only 5 foot 3, and I was 15. And when I saw him having to crouch a little to get through the door because of his size, I remember thinking, Oh shit, no wonder the kids won't misbehave when he's here. I said hi and apologized for the work call, which he just brushed off and said that it needed to be done and not to worry. We were both sat on the couch, and I can't really remember why, but I think we were talking about what days they needed me for. Now, at this stage, the two youngest had went outside to play while I was in with the oldest, as I had just been tidying a little from dinner. I was pretty weirded out because his oldest started to get pretty antsy, when asked to go to the shop. He kept making excuses to his dad, so I had just offered to go. And I could see the dad visibly frustrated and just wanted to defuse the situation. Now, I would like to point out that everything seemed normal at this point, but I remember feeling really intimidated by the dad. I had only met him this one time and spoke for no more than 20 minutes. It turns out that the oldest has said to his mom that he didn't want me left alone with his dad as he had apparently been watching me a little too closely during our short encounter. The parents had asked me to babysit later on in that week, which I had agreed to. However, in the space of a few days, that quickly changed. I got a text from the mom apologizing for the last-minute arrangements but saying that I couldn't babysit. 
I was a little agitated since I had changed plans, but I wasn't too bothered and just said that it was fine and just to let me know when she needs me. She had asked me to come around to get my pay for the last two weeks and I decided to just nip around before going home. As soon as I was in the house, I could tell something was off, but not wanting to pry, I just went in, say hi, talked about books for a little bit, and left. And it wasn't until the next week, I think, or a week after that, where everything kicked off. I came home to my mom being upset and angry, pacing the living room while my stepdad was trying to calm her down. I immediately went to ask what was wrong, feeling a little worried. And instantly, she just threw her arms around me and started crying and holding me. I had meant to be babysitting but again, got cancelled on, so I was home earlier than what I had said originally. Pulling away confused, I asked her what was wrong again. Turns out, my mom had been trying to get a hold of me, but my phone had died. I had went to babysit and nobody was home, so I just decided to head back on the bus but wasn't able to let my mom know. She sits me down and starts trying to ask me questions about the dad and my time babysitting. Confused, I had mentioned that I had only met him once and only really spoke to him on the phone a handful of times when the kids were acting up. Nodding, my mom started pressing on and asked if anything else had happened and kept questioning me saying that I could tell her anything. I just looked at her confused and told that nothing had happened and asked what this was all about. I always remember her taking a deep breath and saying, Oh, thank God. Before letting me know what happened. Now, as I said, the details are vague because this was on the news. Turns out, the guy had killed someone while working and had been taken in by the police. During interrogation, it turns out that he had admitted to beating his wife and there were speculations of assaults. There was also a mention that one of his types were petite girls that had dark hair and pale, which happened to match my description at that time, and my mom was terrified in case something had happened. I'm turning 23 years old this year, and it still gives me shivers. I remember feeling like I was going to throw up and had a sinking feeling in my stomach. My mom held me close crying because she was worried sick all day and scared in case something had happened. And needless to say, I stopped babysitting for the family right there and then. I had felt so awful for the wife as she was honestly one of the nicest women I had ever met. About a week later, I got a text from her as it turns out that I had left some books and so I had said that I would go get them after the phone call. When I saw her, my heart sank. She had obviously not slept and was putting on a brave face for the kids, who weren't sure what was going on. We ended up sitting in the kitchen, and I gave her a hug, just trying to comfort her. I had mentioned that if she needed help with the kids, since he was gone, I would try and help but she immediately refused as it turned out people had started attacking the house. She gave me my stuff, paid for the wages with a little more added and said that she appreciated it but it would be better off if I just took a step back from the family as she didn't want me getting hurt for being associated with them. To this day, I still think about them and it still scares me after thinking about what could have happened. I still talk to the younger kids who are a lot older and even help tutor the young girl. I helped the oldest when he started high school because I noticed the kids bullying him for what his dad had done, which was awful considering it wasn't the fault of the family. But yeah, let's not meet, you psychopath. Thank you. 
Hey, Raven. I have a super weird story from when I was a teenager and used to babysit this kid named Devin. And this was back in the 80s. So some of the details may escape me, but I can remember the majority of what happened during the summer that I had to watch him pretty clearly. Some people out there may say it was nothing creepy or that it wasn't a big deal, but to me it was terrifying. And it's something that I still cannot explain, nor do I know if there really is an explanation, other than it's a weird thing that happened. Devin was an only child, and he was the son of one of my mother's co-workers. The co-worker that my mother used to carpool with, actually, which made things convenient. When summer came around, she asked if I wanted to watch him for the months that he was off school, and it was going to be in their house during the days, so I was all for it. Plus, she was going to pay me $50 a week, so that was a huge bonus for me, being 15 and all. I had met Devin once or twice, and what I knew about him was mostly positive. He seemed like a good kid when we had met, and I had no reservations against it at all. He was about six at the time, so he was decently self-sufficient at some things, but still needed help with other things, and obviously could not be left alone. Honestly, it wasn't even that big of a deal when I went to watch him, and the first week went great. It was the second week where things started getting weird. My mom dropped me off at the house, and I went in, and Devin was actually still asleep, which was a bit off. His mother told me that he had been up late, and to just go ahead and let him sleep. After about two hours, he finally got up and came down the stairs, and he stopped at the base of the stairs and just kind of stared at me. I asked him what was up and if he was okay, and he just stood there, wobbling and staring. It was kind of like he was still asleep while he was standing there, but I don't think that he was sleepwalking. After a few minutes, he looked straight at me and said, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure what he meant, so I asked him what he was sorry for. He kept staring and then walked away to the kitchen and got his breakfast. I wasn't exactly sure what he was going on about or what he meant by it, so I just let it go. And that's when things got weird. That night, I had the weirdest nightmare. In the dream, I was at the house watching Devin, except he wasn't acting like himself. He was sitting on the couch and rocking back and forth aggressively, the whole while mumbling about how things were wrong. In the dream, I asked him if he was okay, like I had that morning, and he attacked me. He jumped on me and started scratching at my face. I woke up in a cold sweat after that, kind of panicking, like, what the hell kind of nightmare was that? It would have been fine if it was a one-time thing, but I had this nightmare numerous times after that night. Watching Devin was always fine. He never did anything weird in real life, but then every single night I would have one of those terrible nightmares where he would be this horrifying being. He would attack me, scratch at me, claw at my throat. In some of the dreams, he would actually try to murder me. He would swing at me with a knife, try to stab me or choke me out. It got to the point where I was hardly sleeping because of how scared I was of having these dreams, and I was actually almost scared to see Devin. He was such a sweet and loving kid in real life, but the nightmares were getting to the point that they were affecting how I was seeing him. I would be sitting on the couch and he would get up to get something, and the second he moved, I would jump. Like, I was actually scared of him running at me and attacking me. I had these nightmares every night the entire time that I watched him, and it really messed with my mental health. What made it even weirder was that the day that school started back up and I was done babysitting him, 
the nightmare stopped happening abruptly. I was horrified that I was going to keep having these dreams on school nights, and that I was going to struggle with sleeping because of it. But it just didn't happen. I have no idea why I had these haunting dreams the whole time that I watched him. I have no idea what prompted my brain to create this really weird scenario, but they didn't start until that day that he came down and told me that he was sorry. It was almost as if he was apologizing to me for causing the dreams in advance. Some people will likely say that I was having dreams about him because I was seeing him every day, and that makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is the fact that they were such terrifying nightmares, and that they started on that specific day. Nor does it make sense to me that I had the same type of nightmare every single night, and then for them to just stop happening when I was done watching him? I don't know if people will see this as something weird or potentially paranormal, or if they'll just say it was a dumb coincidence. But to me, it was scary. And I thought it would be neat to share it with you and your audience, so thank you for reading. I was about 13 or 14, and I was babysitting two boys for some church members. I had done it before, and the kids loved me, and the parents were very comfortable with me. This was a night where they were going to be gone for pretty much until like 2.30 in the morning. I was doing it for free that day, because they were going to do something church-related, and that's just how I rolled. Anyway, the house they lived in was an apartment complex. You know one of those small ones that had two floors and four places in each spot? They're on the bottom floor, with two bedrooms on either side of the apartment, with a kitchen on the left and the living room on the right, with a sliding glass door to a small patio and a public bathroom next to the front door. It was about, I think, 1.30, and I knew they would be getting home soon. The kids were knocked out, obviously, after practically begging, and three bedtime stories. I have also finished my homework, and they didn't have cable. This was the time before Netflix became an online service. But they had a couple of DVDs and VHS to watch, so I grabbed Land Before Time to make the night go quicker. I was already very tired and had nodded off a couple times. And at about 2 a.m., I could hear knocking on the front door. Knowing the parents had a key, I did nothing but sit there in the dark with the TV glowing. Being a paranoid person who watches and reads enough horror, I grabbed the baseball bat that was next to the couch. And what happened next? will haunt me forever. I heard a small voice, almost like a young woman's. Oh dear, that won't help you. My heart stopped, and I realized that the patio door didn't have the blind shut. My eyes shift slowly to the door, and I see someone on the patio staring in. I couldn't make anything out, other than they were very short and wide. I screamed, and I ran into the kids' room. Thankfully, they were still asleep. And sadly, this was before I had a cell phone, and there were no cordless phones. All I did was push the dresser in front of the door and stared at the one window of the room. That's when it became dark, as a shadow loomed on the window. The knocking started again, and the woman's voice called out. Come on, dearie. I won't hurt you. Please, come out. The window was being knocked so hard that I was afraid that it would break. The kids finally woke up, and they were screaming and scared. I was a big girl, and could at that time lift my own weight. But knowing that I had two kids with me, I became vulnerable and afraid. Within two seconds, I hear the father yell out, Hey, 
Who the hell are you? And the person ran off. The front door opened and there was a harsh knocking on the kid's bedroom door. Thankfully, it was the parents, and after I let them in and put the dresser back, I explained what happened and they called the police. When they arrived, they obviously found nothing. But the bushes that hide the patio were obviously cut up and ripped up to get through. I babysat for them once more after that, but after, they moved away about five months later, and I never babysat anyone ever again. And again to this day, I know the woman was long gone, but every time I hear a knock, a chill runs through me. So stranger who was watching me, let's not meet again. When I was younger, I used to find different families to babysit for through Craigslist. My parents helped me set up my own posting, and once I got the hang of it myself, I was able to search for postings from others looking for sitters. I was actually very successful in doing this for quite some time. I also loved it. For the most part, the kids were great, minimal issues, and if I didn't care for a kid because they were just rude and uncontrollable, my parents made an excuse for me to not have to do it anymore. However, this one family I sat for was worse than just having ornery or mean kids. They actually creeped me out. I believe that this was back in about 2008. I had my own car at this point, and the family only lived about 30 miles from me. When I got there, the mom and the dad introduced me to their kids. They were twin boys that were about nine. We'll call them Dylan and Dalton. They looked very nice and well-mannered at first. They were the typical twins type where the parents dress them the same. I remember when I first met them, they had on jeans and matching red and blue shirts. It was a Sunday, and the mom said they had just gotten back from church so they could change their clothes if they wanted to. They gave a few rules, like they were allowed one snack since they were just finishing lunch at the time that I had gotten there, and they were not allowed to play out front since they didn't have a fence around the front yard. Other than some normal things like that, it seemed like they were pretty laid back. They said that they would be gone for a few hours, and they headed out. That first time was fine. A lot of getting to know each other, it seemed. They asked me what school I went to, and they told me about their school and favorite subjects. They shared things about themselves, as well as embarrassing things about each other. It was funny, and all in all, quite a normal visit. It wasn't until the second time that they started getting more comfortable with me, I guess. This time, I went over around 4 o'clock. They hadn't had dinner yet, but the mom told me they had ordered pizza and gave me the cash to pay for it, and that they would be back later around 9 or 10 p.m. After they left, the boys came and watched TV with me until the pizza arrived. While we were eating, Dylan looked up and just gave some random creepy fact like, did you know Gacy killed X amount of boys before he was caught? I learned they knew a lot about serial killers. I didn't know how to respond, so as I do when kids tell me weird stuff, I just went, oh, uh, that's crazy, and then continued to eat my pizza. That's when Dalton made some comment about how stupid he was for doing it. I tried saying something like, some people are just sick and it's hard to understand, I'm sure. But then he specified that he shouldn't have kept them in his own house. That's what got him caught. That one I didn't know how to respond to, so I just stared at him and they started laughing. So I laughed too and said, yeah, people can really do some unthinkable things. Again, they knew a lot about serial killers. I got random facts like that on a regular basis when I went over there, and they even liked to play a pretend game called Killer. 
and they had me play it too, but it was like hide and seek. But if you were it, you were the killer, and if you were found, you were killed. They typically made a slashing motion, like with a knife, and would act like they were stabbing and slicing you. When they found the other, they would just be laughing hysterically. I didn't find out what this game actually was until I was playing it, because they just said it was hide-and-seek. I wasn't comfortable playing it after the first time, and I told them that they shouldn't do that either. They actually seemed confused as to why, saying, It's not like we're really killing you. All with this creepy smile on their face. I just tried explaining that it could scare people, so it's best to just play normal hide-and-seek. That didn't stop them from doing other creepy things, though. I continued to get creepy facts about killers, death, and other grim things. They also tried to watch scary movies or documentaries on crimes, but I didn't allow it because of their age. There was one time I went over there and they were in the middle of watching one of the child's play movies, so I played it off when the parents were there and said, Oh, is it okay if they watch those movies? And their response was like, Why wouldn't they? As they told me, yeah, they're just not allowed to watch anything with nudity. Makes sense. So, since that was confirmed, they seemed to take advantage of it and watched some of the weirdest movies while I was there. Even if they were watching something a normal nine-year-old would watch, they would change it as soon as their parents left. I liked scary movies myself, so I was okay with watching it, but their demeanor was more unsettling. Celebrating when someone died or making fun of them for a choice that they made. One of the last straws for me was when I was doing some homework and they had been in their room playing, I felt like I was being watched, so I looked behind me, where the hall was to their bedroom, and I saw one of them standing there. I asked them if there was something wrong, and while smiling, they just said, I bet I could have tied you up just now. I just didn't have any rope. And then went back to their room. Nope. I was no longer comfortable being alone with them. Some of the stuff they did was definitely odd for their age, but still being young myself, who was I to judge someone's parenting? So, I never brought it up to their parents. But that time, I did. I told them that night what they had said to me, and about their weird killer game, and they basically laughed it off, saying, boys will be boys. They also said that they mean no harm or would never actually do anything to me, and talked about how they are still easier to raise than girls. So, with their parents being uncaring, I thought maybe I was overreacting. I actually only had sisters, so I didn't know what boys were like at home. What I did do, though, was the next time I babysat, I made sure I wasn't alone. After asking the boys' parents, they said they were okay with me bringing a friend over girls only, but they wouldn't be paying for both of us, so I just split the money with said friend. So the first time we were over there, after the parents left, one of them said, Oh, a second victim, and started laughing. While we ate dinner, they asked her all the same questions they asked me the first time, and then went to their room to play. Once they were out of sight, I was talking to my friend who agreed that they seemed a little weird, but she hadn't really experienced it to the fullest. Until later that night, I hadn't noticed that one of them went to the restroom and the other had called me into their room. I went into their room to see Dylan standing on the bed and he asked me to come closer, waving for me hurriedly. I approached him quickly, thinking he needed to tell me something, or maybe something was wrong. Once I got close enough, he was able to look over my head and said, It'd be much easier to throw a bag over your head when I'm this tall. Freaked out, I told him that was not a nice thing to say, nor should he even think about those things, and he just looked confused as to why I would say that. 
I just left the room and went back to the living room to see Dalton acting something out in front of my friend, and she just looked shocked. I walked in on him explaining something about dirt, and when I asked what was going on, he stopped and said nothing and then walked away, back into their room. Afterwards, I asked my friend what he was talking about, and she said that Dalton had been explaining why dumping a body in the water was better than burying it. She finally understood what I meant by them being creepy. I like my fair share of scary movies and crime documentaries, but I don't remember being interested or retaining knowledge like they did at that age. My friend said that she would not go back with me, and suggested that I didn't go back either. I ended up telling my parents a little more about the things they said and did, and they were disappointed that I didn't tell them sooner. They agreed that it was also not appropriate behavior for kids their age, and said that they didn't want me over there anymore. They actually called their mom and explained everything, and she still didn't see anything wrong with it. She said that she thought I did great with her boys and even offered to pay double if I watched them a few more times. It was hard to pass up, thinking I could just buck up and get the money, but my parents refused. I was 17 and still living with them, so what they say goes, and I didn't go back. Every once in a while, I try to look them up to see if they ever acted out on their little games, but... I never did find anything. I hope that they were just really weird kids and grew out of it, but it did sure scare the hell out of me and my friend. So my friend had been babysitting a child of a family friend of hers. She was maybe 14 at that time. These people lived about 30 minutes outside of town, on a really beautiful acreage with a combination of rolling hills and thick forest. She had just put the little boy down to sleep and she went back out to watch some TV and wait for his parents to get home. Not many lights were on in the house and it was one of those long houses with a few doors, two in the front and then three in the back. The deck was a big wraparound and the house was a bungalow style. Anyways, she was sitting there watching TV, and she hears the crunching of snow and footsteps from out on the deck, assuming it was just a deer or coyote. Since she was pretty far out, she just continued to watch her show. Then, from one of the back doors at the other end of the house, she can hear a handle jiggling. At this point, She's a little freaked out and turns down the volume. She is sitting there, listening, and then hears the crunching footsteps come from the other end of the house to right near the door where she is closest to. She wasn't facing the door, but she sat there for a second, and then finally heard the handle jiggle furiously behind her. She turns her head and sees a man's silhouette just smashing on the door handle. Panicked, she runs to the boy's room, and as she opens his door, he is crying in his room asking if she heard what he heard. She had not grabbed any phones on the way to his room, so she had to slip back out to find one. Feeling a rush of adrenaline, she turns on all the outside lights to the deck and leaves the ones inside off so he can't see where in the house she is. And while she is turning on the lights, she looks onto the deck and sees footprints in the fresh snow. And after she has all the lights on, she runs back to the boy's room with a phone. She calls her dad crying and tells him what happened. And immediately, after she hangs up, he grabs his shotgun and starts heading over. She then calls the little boy's parents to see if maybe it had been someone they knew. And they said that it was nobody they knew and that they thought it highly unlikely would be someone else as they had lived so far out in the middle of nowhere. They suggested it was an owl. Regardless, they called the neighbor to come over 
and she comes and sits with my friend. My friend was pretty shaken, but her dad had arrived in about 15 minutes, which means he had been speeding tremendously, and he then searched the property. About an hour later, the parents come home and explain that it was probably an owl landing on the door handle. They never called police or anything to come check for fingerprints or footprints. And needless to say, my friend never babysat for them again. I used to babysit and do light housework for this family for many years. They had one kid named Jacob, and at the time, he was probably around eight, I believe. I started watching him about a year earlier, so I had gotten to know him and his family pretty well. Jacob was your average little boy, nothing weird about him, and he was very soft-spoken and well-mannered. He was obsessed with Spongebob at the time, so we watched a lot of that, but that was probably the worst it ever got with him. I was already out of high school at this point, so there were times that I watched him last minute when there was an emergency, or something they had to do quickly. So when they called me asking if I could watch him the following day unexpectedly, I didn't hesitate. I didn't have anything to do that day as I was on summer break from my college courses, so at least I could make some extra money. When I got there, Jacob's mom, Anna, explained that she had to take her aunt Barb to the hospital for surgery. I don't remember what the surgery was, but it wasn't major. It had something to do with a vein in her leg, I believe, or something similar. Anna was planning to just take Jacob with her, but as kids do, he became a bit upset at the thought of having to sit quietly at a hospital with very little to do. So, she asked if I could watch him. I had to be there around 10 in the morning because her surgery was going to be around noon, and they wanted to get there earlier for check-in and paperwork. When I arrived, Anna and Barb were both there as she went ahead and stayed the night there. I'd met Barb before, and she was a very sweet lady, and seemed to be fairly close to Jacob as well. He was sitting next to her when I got there, and he was reading a book to her. Anna told me a few of the things and asked me to bring the clothes up from the laundry room. I gave well wishes to the two ladies, and they were off, leaving us to our day. The day started out fine. I got the laundry out and even folded and put it away. I even helped him put together a little Lego set. Overall, it was a normal day there. Anna said that she expected to be home a little before visiting hours were over, so she could still come home and make dinner, and said that she would call when she was out of surgery to check in on us. I was expecting to be there until around 6, so I was thinking it would be a laid-back day of watching movies and playing around on my laptop. Jacob played in his room some, and then came into the living room and watched TV with me for a while. It was probably around two. We'd already had lunch and we went back to watching a movie. But then, out of nowhere, Jacob started whimpering. I looked over at him, thinking maybe he was holding back from laughing because of the movie, but he looked visibly distraught. I asked him if he was okay, and he didn't respond so I put my hand on his shoulder to get his attention, and that's when he started bawling. The crying was just non-stop, and I had no idea what was wrong. I tried to calm him the best that I could and tell him everything was okay, and tried to find out what was going on. When he did finally stop to breathe, he said very softly, Barbie's dead. I didn't think I quite heard him, so I asked him again, and he said, Aunt Barbie died. He called his great-aunt Barbie, and knowing that she just went in for something simple, I tried to assure him that she was okay, and that he would probably see her soon, thinking that Anna might take him up there tomorrow or something. He looked so sad for a little boy, 
like nothing I've ever seen on a kid before. I was almost choking up myself, but I held it together. I thought for him, but he put his hand on my cheek and smiled, saying, It's okay. She's not in pain anymore. I was pretty confused at this point, and I didn't know what else to say, so I just watched as he sat back down on the couch, let out a big sigh, and continued to watch the movie. I didn't know how to feel about all this, so I just sat there looking over at him every once in a while, and saw him smiling and giggling. I thought that maybe it was just some weird thing he decided to do. Maybe he overheard them talking about her surgery and was scared, not really knowing what it was, so I just let it be. And I thought I would just tell Anna and her husband, Tom, about it when they got home. It had been a few more hours and a few snacks later that I realized that Anna hadn't even called me to give me an update, but I just thought that maybe she had forgotten and would call when she got the chance. It was more for her to check in on us, so I wasn't really worried. But when it hit 5pm and still no word from her, I thought I would call her at least and leave a message saying everything was okay which I did since she didn't answer. I also called Tom since I knew that he got off around 7 to give an update as a sly way of calling to see if everything was okay. Soon after, I got a call back from Tom, and he seemed a little disheveled in his conversation when asking how Jacob was. As mentioned, I got to know this family pretty well, so I asked if there was something wrong and he said that Barb had had some complications and surgery, delaying Anna from coming home. He then asked if I was willing to possibly stay the night, or at least later, and that they would pay more and also offered to pay for dinner. Of course I agreed. I gave him well wishes and then we waited for dinner to arrive. It was probably around nine or so, Jacob had fallen asleep on the floor in his room playing when Tom finally came home. He apologized for making me stay so late, but then told me that Barb had actually died during the surgery. I was shocked at first, knowing it wasn't supposed to be life-threatening, but she had complications with the anesthesia and stopped breathing. It's not something that happened often, I guess, but... It was still a risk, and sadly, a life was lost. That's when I remembered Jacob's little episode he'd had, and I told Tom about it. I told him about the time and how it was like a switch and the tears started falling, and he claimed that she had passed. He thought it was really strange, too, and confirmed that they never mentioned that she could die from the surgery or anything like that so we had no idea where he would have come up with the idea. Other than that, though, he didn't really have much more to say about it, and he thanked me for my time. He tried to pay me double, but it didn't feel right, so I didn't accept it. He told me that Anna had gone to be with her cousin, so she wasn't going to be home that night. I actually talked to Anna about it many months later, not wanting to bring it up too soon, and it seemed to touch her a bit. She said that Barb was like another mother to Jacob, and it feels like their bond was just that strong that she had reached him after she passed, and let him know that she was okay. It still gives me chills thinking about it to this day. Jacob is almost 17 now, and he has no memory of that day. But he does remember Barb vividly, and says that he felt like he already knew she was gone when his parents finally explained to him what happened. Either way, it was quite the experience for a babysitter. And here are the top comments for my last video. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. 
Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you can also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.